In this video, we're going to practice graphing the cosecant function. And there's a period change because of that b value. There's a phase shift, but it's not pi over 4, so be careful there. And there's a vertical shift. So the first thing I would do if I were you is I would rewrite this equation. Whenever you have a b value and a phase shift that's trying to happen, you need to factor out uh, the b value. So I'm going to put that 1 half in the front and then that's going to leave x minus something that's not pi over 4. So to figure out what goes here I need to take that pi over 4 and I need to divide it by the b value. I need to divide by 1 half. Well when you have fractions and you're dividing of course you know you multiply by the reciprocal. So this is going to be 2 pi over 4 or pi over 2. So that's what should go inside of the parentheses right now is pi over 2. Alright and then I'll have the rest of it. So really it's like I have parentheses inside of parentheses. Okay so this is the version of the function I'm going to be looking at as I do the rest of the problem. So the first thing I like to do is uh, come up with the period. We know that the period is always the normal period divided by the b value. For um, cosecant and sine, that's going to be 2 pi. Okay, so that means the period is going to be 2 pi divided by 1 half, which means, uh, you know, you multiply by the reciprocal. So that's 2 pi times 2. So the period is 4 pi. All right, so everyone should have that the period is 4 pi. Now the phase shift is right here, but we do the opposite sign. So the, this negative pi over 2 means that the phase shift is positive pi over 2 to the right. And that's really important because uh, I always start at the phase shift if there is one. So normally we start at 0. But not this time, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to start at pi over 2 because of that phase shift. Okay, so I'm going to put pi over 2 right here. And I'm going to go four spaces to the right. For sine and cosecant, we only need one period, so I'm just only going to go to the right. So here I go. One, two, three, four. All right, that should be enough. Uh, of course, I need to know what these values are. I got to label them. Very important. So let's see, how do I do that? Well, when I have a phase shift and I'm trying to label things, <coughs> I remember to myself that every one of these marks is a quarter of a period. Quarter period. So I ask myself, wait a minute, what is a quarter of a period? Quarter period. Well, Okay, this one's going to be a little extra easy since the, uh, the original period is 4 pi. A quarter of a period would be 4 pi divided by 4. In other words, pi. So a quarter period is pi. Which means from mark to mark, I'm going to add pi. So that's what I'm about to do. Um, but when I go to add pi, I realize that I need like denominators. So I think to myself, hmm, like denominators, what am I going to do? Well, if I multiply by 2, pi turns out to be the same thing as 2 pi over 2. So that's what I'm going to add instead. All right, instead of adding pi, I'll think of it as 2 pi over 2, which is the same thing. So here I go. So this is kind of like 1 pi over 2. So if I add 2 pi over 2, then that'll be 3 pi over 2. And if I add another 2 pi over 2, that would be 5 pi over 2. And if I added another 2, that would be 7 pi over 2. And then 9 pi over 2. All right, normally I leave all this great space so I can reduce. But now I feel a little silly because none of these reduce, so I did that for nothing. So I'm just going to recopy them. Don't mind me. Don't judge me. You don't know my life over 2, so we got 7 pi over 2, 
9 pi over 2. OK, great. But had we needed to reduce, we would have had space, and I would have looked like a genius, whatever. It's fine. Now, I'm going to need to go. I need to know where my y-axis is. Y-axis always goes at 0. So by the way, some of you guys want to always put a big old line right in the middle of this, like where 5 pi over 2 is or something. Or, or maybe you'll automatically put it at the phase shift, put a big line at pi over 2. Don't do that. Y-axis is at 0, not pi over 2. So I need to put a few more marks to the left until I get to a negative number. That's what I'm about to do right now. So I'm going to go to the left a couple of marks. I, ha I was adding 2 pi over 2. So now I'm going to subtract 2 pi over 2. Um, but if I do 1 pi over 2 minus 2 pi over 2, immediately that gives me negative pi over 2. All right, which tells me that the y-axis was in, in between there. So this is where I'm going to put my y-axis. I'm going to erase this nonsense. So here goes my y-axis right here. There is a vertical shift of up 1. So I'm going to go ahead and put a 1 right here. The amplitude, the a value, is 1. Um, so that tells me I'm going to have to go up one more for my a value. So I'm going to also put a mark on my y-axis, call it 2. Now back to the midline, back to the plus 1. Since that's my midline, I'm going to go ahead and put my dotted line right there. All right, put a dotted line at the midline, okay. And then I'm also going to put a dotted line at my a values above and below. I'm going to, this is optional, so you can decide how cool you want to be. Some people want to stay humble, so they don't want to be too cool. Um, but if you want to be really cool, go ahead and put an extra dotted line at the A value. Um, the lower A value would be on the x-axis, so I can do it in yellow, so I can still see it a little bit. If you were doing this in pencil, you, you wouldn't be able to see it. Anyway, I think I'm golden now. I think I'm ready for business. It's time to remember that cosecant is the reciprocal of the sine function. So what I always do is I start off actually graphing the sine function, just straight up graphing the sine function. Um, I remember that the sine function begins and ends on the midline. So remember we started at the phase shift pi over 2. So the sine function is going to begin and end on the midline. In between, we know what the sine function does. We've been doing this like all year, it seems like. It's going to go up high and then back to the midline. And then it's going to go down low and then back to the midline. So I'm just going to very faintly, ever so slightly, all right, graph the sine function in a dotted way and very light dots at that. So there's my sine function. Um, now I'm prepared to do my cosecant function. Let's talk asymptotes, y'all. Um, the sine function, picturing the midline as though it were the x-axis, you know, like it was before we shifted things around, um, it makes sense that anywhere that the sine function would be 0, that's an asymptote. So that means anywhere the sine function touches the midline, that's going to be an asymptote. So I'm going to have an asymptote at pi over 2, okay, where it touches the midline. And I'm going to have an asymptote at 5 pi over 2, touches the midline. <coughs> and I'm going to have an asymptote at 9 pi over 2, where it touches the midline. Everywhere it touches the midline, it's going to be an asymptote for, for all, all of these um, reciprocal trig functions. OK, now I can go ahead and graph the real thing. We have learned that the actual cosecant function has, the, um, has two points in common with the sine function. The high and the low are actually the same point for both functions. So 
the, these blue dots are on my actual cosecant function. So then I can use them and the asymptotes to graph the rest of my function. All I have to do is approach the asymptotes going away from the midline. And there I've graphed that part of it. Same thing on the low. Okay, approach the asymptotes, approach the asymptotes. All right, and that's it. That's what your graph should look like. Okay, now it's time to, um, let's see, vertical shift up one. Going to go ahead and mention that. Reflection, there was none. Okay, there would be a reflection if there was like a negative sign in the front. There wasn't. Uh, now, vertical asymptotes. I always will start with the first vertical asymptote, pi over 2. A vertical line is always x equals something. So I'm going to say x equals pi over 2. All right, that's my first asymptote. But then I have to add however far it takes to get to the next asymptote. And I'm noticing, wait a minute, do I have to go a full period? Or am I only going a half a period? Well, from asymptote to asymptote, it's only two jumps, two spaces. That's half, half a period. Um, so look, a full period is 4 pi. So if I'm only going half a period, that must be 2 pi. So that tells me that I need to add 2 pi. And I'll throw an n in there as a multiplier. If n is an integer, which I must mention, integer, By including that, now I have all of the asymptotes going to the left and the right forever. All right, that is it for problem number four.